Good morning. This is the day that God has made. Look at this room. Over 2,000 people are gathered here. More than one rabbi and more than one priest and not a few Muslims. What a cross-section of religions and races and cultures and national origins. The United States of America is the most religious country in the West. More than three quarters of its people believe in some kind of Judeo-Christian God. Moreover, it's the only society in the world where new religions, cults, sects, and therapies, all based upon Christianity, are being invented every day. And no powerful person is more powerful than you. Religious fervor goes back a long way in America. The ministry that built this high-tech megachurch dates back to the 17th century. It was the early religious missions that played a vital role in the artistic and cultural development of America. What could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness full of wild beasts and wild men? They looked behind them and there was the mighty ocean which they had passed and was now as a gulf to separate them from the civil parts of the world. What could sustain them now but the Spirit of God and His grace? So wrote William Bradford after he and his fellow pilgrims landed in 1620 at Plymouth fleeing religious persecution in England. It is now no time to pamper the flesh, live at ease, snatch, catch, scrape and peel and hoard up, but rather to open the doors, the chests and vessels and say, brother, neighbour, friend, what want ye? All the year round, tourists come in droves to this late 20th century reconstruction of the first Plymouth colony. After all, the ancestry of about 15 million Americans today began in, or perhaps behind, the lost originals of these primitive huts. Here it is always 1627, seven years after the Mayflower arrived. Nothing remains of the original Plymouth, and this is an elaborate facsimile built on the coast nearby, historically, ecologically and technically accurate, down to the last sheep and shoelace and saw pit. The Pilgrims were the most radical wing of 17th century English Puritanism. They were, in effect, the Protestants' Protestants. They regarded mainstream Anglicanism as just as impure and hopelessly corrupt as the Church of Rome, and they wanted to make a fresh start on a clean slate over here in the New World. Almighty Jehovah, we pray that thou wilt look down upon us this day and hear the prayer of thy faithful, O Lord. Thou hast oft brought us many blessings here in this wilderness. From our first coming into this land, O Lord, thou hast brought us out of this wilderness. You have a well-made house, you have delicious food, you have silverware and books and pottery and everything that domestic life requires, except it seems one thing. I don't see any pictures here. Why is that? We, we are not like those Dutchmen. Uh, having lived in Leiden, uh, I can assure you, sir, you might find there fine paintings upon the walls of a man's house. It is a great fashion. Mm -hmm. I think it is no great ill, uh, though I must say uh, I am well contented with the more simpler life we have in this place. But in particular you don't have any pictures of what, uh, of the kind that a, that a Catholic might have, uh, uh, the uh, pictures of Jesus yeah, and, and the saints. And the shrines and relics, this is all a great superstition unto mankind and much of the work of the devil, blinding men with things of man's art. Mm and keeping man from the proper reverence unto God.
the first colonists in the 17th century saw the unexplored land as a blank slate on which they could write their designs and find their chance to create utopia. And their visions of what such a place might mean have left indelible traces on the identity of modern America. The wilderness was untamed, they were right about that, but it was not no man's land. To about 12 million American Indians, it was home. And the first big cultural collision between colonist and native took place here in the desert tablelands of the Southwest. Charged with the hunger for conquest just 50 years after Columbus, the Spaniards marched north to what would be known as New Mexico. The Spaniards thought they would find infinite gold as Cortes and his conquistadores had in old Mexico. They hoped that paradise was here for the taking. They'd heard talk of golden cities, the seven cities of Cibola, but instead they found tribal Indians living in multi-story villages, the Pueblo Indians. They had pottery, but not gold. The Spanish never did find gold. But on their wild goose chase after non-existent treasure, they at last arrived at the foot of Sky City, the ancient city of Arkema. One bemused Spaniard called it the greatest stronghold ever seen in the world. With its 2,000 dwellings, this is the oldest continuously populated city in North America. The Arkemas had lived here for a thousand years before the Spanish arrived. For them, it was a sacred place, but not for the invaders. In 1599, the Spanish massacred most of the Arkhamas and sold the rest into slavery. Yet the Arkhamas built up their community again, and their descendants were persuaded by the Franciscan missionaries to build an immense shrine on the rock to their god, the Catholic god. The Church of San Esteban was finished by the 1720s. By then, it was by far the largest mission church in all of New Mexico, with its immense cyclopean walls, 10 feet thick at the base, and its 150-foot-long nave, all of it entailing something like 20,000 tons of rock and clay, every ounce of which had to be brought up from the valley floor below on people's backs because there wasn't any loose fill on top of the mesa. Indian labor, Spanish techniques. The basic unit of San Esteban is the mud brick, the adobe, a simple technology which the Spaniards had brought with them from the old world. Because the adobe is only dried mud, the rain melts it and it is in constant need of repair. The repeated coats of mud produce singular organic forms that are the signature of the adobe style, as in this church at Ranchos de Taos. Seventy years ago, these fluid shapes would inspire the work of modernist artists like Georgia O'Keeffe. The pure and primal character of the southwestern desert would draw her and other artists from New York looking for the primitive, as Gauguin was drawn to Tahiti. In the magnificent fierce morning of New Mexico, wrote D. H. Lawrence, the old world gave way to the new. So bring that adobe brick on wheels over to squeaky clean car... Modern New Mexico fetishizes its cultural past. Founded in 1610, Santa Fe is the oldest European city in North America. But here, the adobe style isn't just pervasive, it's mandatory. The law says you can't build a chain store or a gas station unless it's in the manner of a 17th century mission church. This goes hand in hand with the artiness of the place, stuffed with every kind of pious ethno kitsch displaying its multiculti credentials.
To see earlier examples of artistic fusion on the southwestern frontier, it's better to go to places like the Church of San Jose in Laguna Pueblo. It was built around 1700, and its friars embraced Pueblo art. <laughs> <laughs> 